So exciting to see people coming in. Welcome. All right, it, my name is Christine Housel. I work for GlobeEthics.net based in Geneva in the area of donor relations and strategic partnerships. And it's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of GlobeEthics.net to our fourth live chat as a part of our pre-conference period, building new bridges together, strengthening ethics in higher education post COVID-19. And so it is my pleasure to welcome today's moderator, who is Herbert McKinda. And Herbert McKinda is the program executive for GlobeEthics.net East Africa, hosted at Catholic University of Eastern Africa, where he also teaches research methods. Welcome, Herbert. Thank you, Christine. Uh, dear participants, welcome to this session. Thank you for be continually uh, being committed to participating in these pre-conference sessions. I take this opportunity to first and foremost welcome you to this session today, but also inform you of the house guidelines for the smooth progress of our session, which is timed at one hour. First and foremost, we kindly request you to take note that uh, this session is being recorded and it will be made available on the Global Ethics website uh, after this, these meetings. We also kindly request you to mute your microphones during the session, but we will be allowed at the end uh, a few minutes to socialize with colleagues. And thirdly, I, I wish to no, take, uh, tell you that uh, we, we will not be allowed to speak, asking no questions or the like, but we request you to use the chat button at the bottom of your screen to post your questions and comments during this session. They will be read out on your behalf and the panelists will be responding to them. Thank you so much for that. Our theme today is ethics and skills for responsible global citizenship, which is a timely topic. It comes at a time when the world is at a near standstill, uh, occasioned by many challenges, and especially the pandemic COVID-19. A global citizenship education will go a long way to enabling learners and everyone to assume active roles, both at home and internationally, to build a more peaceful, tolerant, inclusive and secure societies. To bring up us up to speed on this topic is a panel of eminent personalities. Allow me to invite you to join me in welcoming the panelists of the day. And I start with our first panelist, Irene Luji. Irene is from Indonesia. She is a student at Claremont Graduate University in California, the United States of America. She will be presenting to us on reimagining solidarity, the ethical duty of global citizens in the time of COVID-19. Our second panelist is Gadiali Zahar. Gadiali is the, uh, an associate dean emeritus, Christ University, Bangalore in India. He is currently a visiting faculty member of FHWS University, Wurzburg in Germany. He will be presenting to us on ethical leadership in a globally dynamic world. The third panelist is Melita Macheta. Melita is the head of the Zagreb Stock Exchange Academy in Croatia. She will be presenting to us on youth financial responsibility, how to develop it. And our fourth and final panelist is Josephine Raj. Josephine holds a master's degree in English literature and Christian studies 
and a master's in theology specializing in Christian theology. He serves as the academic dean, faculty of theology, at the New Life Biblical Seminary in Jerufakal, Kerala, in India. Previously, he taught in church on the Rock Theological Seminary in Vishakapatnam and Mission India Theological Seminary in Nagpur. He is an author of several publications and research papers. He will be presenting to us on the rationale of ethics for global citizens. And finally, I wish to introduce our listener for today, Daniel Lopez. Daniel Lopez wears a number of hats. For the interest of time, I will just mention two. He is an editor and director of Convergencias Philosophy and Cultures on Dialogue and Convergencias Indian Philosophies in Buenos Aires in Argentina. He is also a member of the board of directors of the Argentine Philosophical Archive of the National Academy of Sciences in Buenos Aires. I take this opportunity now to invite our first panelist, Irene Luigi, to do our presentation. Irene, you have seven minutes. I will notify you when one minute is left. Welcome. Thank you, Herbert, and hello, everyone. Um, thank you for the opportunity to share my presentation on ethics and global citizenship. My name is Irene from Indonesia. However, as mentioned, I'm currently living in California where I study philosophy of religion and theology with focus on religious ethics. The title of my presentation is Reimagining Solidarity, the ethical duty of global citizens in the time of COVID-19. We all know that one of the primary purposes of promoting ethics in higher education is the development of responsible global citizens around the world. Therefore, the questions that I want to explore in these presentations include first, who is included in the concept of global citizenship and why does the concept matter in the time of COVID-19. Second, how can solidarity as the basis of ethical duty contribute to strengthening the role of global citizens in the time of COVID-19? Now to understand the term global citizens, it is crucial to distinguish between the institutional and ethical understandings of global citizenship. In this presentation, the focus will be on the latter where the term global citizenship represents how the understanding of a person's moral duties toward one another can and should be understood within the global dimension. Those who accept the concept of global citizenship acknowledge that all human beings have a certain moral status and that we have a moral responsibility toward one another in this global moral community. In other words, when someone says, I am a global citizen, she is making some kind of moral claim about the nature and the scope of her moral obligation. Next, I want to focus on one ethical virtue, which is solidarity. Obviously, acknowledging solidarity as a basis for a global citizen's moral duty in the time of COVID-19 does not mean arguing that solidarity is the only relevant approach to understanding the ethical duty of global citizens. However, it is undoubtedly one important ethical approach on which I want to focus on. There are many theories on solidarity and on the ethic of solidarity. But in this presentation, I will focus on one contemporary theory, which is the one from Dr. An Salmin. Because of the limited time, there are only two main points that I want to highlight 
from Dr. Min. First, Min in his book, The Solidarity of Others in a Divided World, argues that solidarity is a quality that exists within human nature. Consequently, to be human means to have solidarity towards others. Second, Min's concept of solidarity is based within the 21st century context where globalization and interconnection play a vital role in the lives of individuals and communities around the world. The acknowledgement toward the context that we are living today, according to Min, leads to a twofold dialectic in the relationship with others that Min calls the dialectic of differentiation in which we are made increasingly aware of our differences and the dialectic of interdependence in which we are compelled to find a way of living together despite our differences. In other words, solidarity must lead us not only to respect our differences, but also to treasure our differences. According to Min, our solidarity is not merely with others, it is of others, because solidarity of others concentrates on the acknowledgement that, quote, all are others to one another, that we as others to one another are equally responsible. Individuals and communities in different parts of the world are doing different things to fight against COVID-19. For example, in this age of information with the digital divide, teachers and students in higher education in one part of the world are dealing with limited to no access to online classes. And they have to find different ways to deal with the situation, be it delivering print books, held a class in an open air places, or even use radio, national television to broadcast the educational materials. In contrast, in other parts of the world, the struggle is entirely different because the internet connection is stable, but there are other concerns there are other problems that teachers and students must deal with in this time of COVID-19. What I want to emphasize is that it is crucial that One all minute left. these efforts, thank you, Herbert, I'm almost done. What I want to emphasize is that it is crucial that all these efforts when conducted by global citizens are being carried out under the acknowledgement of solidarity of others as moral duty. To conclude, our lack of preparedness for the pandemic reveals the lack of solidarity in our global life. COVID-19 has brought the opportunity to rethink our collective commitments to others and reminds us of the global responsibilities of global citizens around the world. To reimagine solidarity means to think of solidarity not as a form of charity or mere feeling of sympathy, but solidarity that is the ethical duty of all global citizens, solidarity of others that will take different forms in different parts of the world because of our differences and because of under our interconnection. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Irene. Thank you for tell, uh, letting us know that uh, COVID-19 has given us the opportunity to rethink our connect connectedness. I take this opportunity to welcome Christine, to take us through the next session, question and answer or comments. And kindly participants, you are welcome to share your, your comments on the chat for, forum so that uh, they can be read out. Welcome. Thank you so much, Irina. And yes, please put your questions in the chat box for our speaker, A valuable moment to interact with her. As we're waiting for some questions, let me um, express my thanks for focusing on one very important um, point, especially now in these days. And my question is, 
Um, does Dr. Min or do you yourself have some recommendations for how to shift us into a greater solidarity where in fact we, 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 we see that not only do we not treasure sometimes, sometimes we're lacking even basic respect. The how, how do we move ourselves? Um, thank you, Christine, for the question. Um, there are steps that we can follow, even though this is not from Dr. Min himself. Um, this is from Professor Rebecca Todd Peters, who wrote the book, The Ethic of Solidarity. She said there are three steps, practical steps that we can follow. First is what she called to learn about your social location. Social locations um, refers to the set of identity forming circumstances. So including race, gender, ethnicity, culture. In other words, we need to know our locus, our context. Once we understand our social location, the second steps that she suggested is to start to develop relationship with people across lines of differences. This is the same point that Dr. Min stated in um, his theory. It is important to have a relationship with people who we know that are different from us, but who acknowledge that we are all interconnected in this global world. Because Developing relationship with people across lines of difference is essential to promote uh, consciousness raising and sustaining long term social change, if that is what we want. And the third, the last uh, steps, uh, Dr. Peter Todd says to act to actually do it because successful long term social change requires uh, uh, hard work because we have to address the structural root of the social problems and the injustice that we are uh, experiencing. Okay, we have um, a rephrasing. Solidarity might mean all in one and one, one in all. And we have um, an a, a interest in your um, description of solid, solidarity of others versus a solidarity with others. And two questions, well, three questions, and I'll, I'll leave it to you to see how to, how to organize yourself. How can we become global citizens given the lack of equity globally? Do you have some examples of ethical solidarity? And specifically as a student, how can students respond to, solidar to the call to solidarity in this period of pandemic? You have about, you have about two minutes. Um, as a student, I hope that by doing something like this to contribute academically to join so many webinar, I'm learning new things and I hope from that I can contribute back to the community, especially to the university when I go back and teach in Indonesia. Um, Dr. Min specifically focus on solidarity of others not that he is against with others, but he wants to make sure that we've, we acknowledge our differences. Sometimes when we talk about solidarity, we wanted to pass through our similarities. What makes us so, so uh, what makes us the same? That's why we have to have solidarity with others who are the same as us. But Dr. Min, in his theory, he wants to focus on first appreciate the differences. I personally believe that a theory of solidarity that reflects appreciation of differences that mark human existence really can offer people the opportunity to reimagine, to create new partnership that respect um, different uh, perspectives, different gifts, different talents that different people can bring to the table. Last thing that I wanna mention, uh, in COVID-19, we hear people say social dis distancing. We also people s hear people say, we are all in this together. Well, ethically, it's um, when we say social distancing, we are saying that we have to set ourselves apart from others. When we are saying we are all in this together, we are saying let's, let's stay together. So I find that solidarity is the concept um, uh, that represents both. As a response to pandemic, we need both. Solidarity implies respect of difference in the midst of working together with others toward uh, what is our common good. 
Thank you, Christine. Thank, thank you, Irene, Irene for- Irene, back to you, Herbert. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you, Irene, for uh, your presentation and uh, reactions to the comments and questions. I now welcome uh, Zahar Gadiali to make his presentation. Gadiali, you have seven minutes also, starting now. Thank you. For the good introduction that you gave me, am I being heard? Yeah, yeah, you have. Yeah, and basically, virtually very happy to be with you today. It is literally virtually that we are together. And uh, I would also like to thank uh, Irene uh, Luji for sort of making a background to my presentation. So I would like to thank her for that. And uh, basically, I would like to say three cheers for Globe Ethics for giving us this opportunity to uh, discuss various aspects of ethical leadership. Now, I would like to basically, uh, you know, put some questions. Uh, and uh, I would like to say that when we talk about ethical leadership in a globally dynamic world, can there be leadership without ethics? Uh, could we give examples like that of Assad of Syria and Kim Jong-un of North Korea? Can there be full ethic, ethics without the help of leadership at all? I mean, it is absolutely full of ethics, but there is no leadership attempt. And I would say that maybe we can quote uh, Mother Teresa Gandhi, Martin Luther King, Nelson Mandela. But basically, when we talk about ethical leadership, it is a continuum between uh, ethics and leadership on a, on a wide basis. When we talk about uh, global, globally, we know that we are now standing at the death of time and distance. And we have a new concept, particularly after COVID-19, of the question of remote leadership and digital leadership, which has to be taken into consideration. And we say that it is glo globally dynamic world, dynamic in the sense that uh, after COVID-19, I think the whole situation with respect to work from home has changed and the emerging digital technologies have changed the entire situation. When we talk about the world, we are saying that we are worldwide, we are multicultural, we are multi-locational. So that's uh, with respect to the background. Uh, what I would like to shift to very quickly is uh, we need to make a difference between ethics, morals and values. Uh, very quickly, uh, when we talk about ethics, we are talking about a, not a particular person as we would possibly think about in morals, but ethics are for a group of people, you know, they are externally prescribed and there is a reason, whereas morals is basically something which is pertaining to me, I, and it, it could be absolutely, uh, slide, slide please, yeah. It could be, as far as morals are concerned, it is binary. It's either good or bad, vice or virtue, uh, and so on. And when we talk about values, we are talking about uh, basically the values which we have, slide please, values which have become beliefs over the period of time. Next, next one. Now, the important thing is that there has to be some sort of a balance among all these three. And if this, there is an imbalance, there is sort of a, a mismatch. Because take, the, take into consideration the aspect of ethics. If a particular university plans to lower admission requirements to admit more students because it has to want more revenue, but as I teach, as a teacher, I am opposed to any dilution in academic standards. So there is a mismatch between my ethics and the university ethics. And somehow this has to be brought into uh, unison. Next one, please. The important thing here is that there are certain responsible agents in the educational system. Uh, we talk about something which is internal, which is education institute per se, which has an internal code of conduct and an ethical code. And the important thing is that this particular institution 
is influenced by various external aspects. Number one, the students. Now, what are the aspects with the students with respect to the unethical aspects which have to be managed? Is plagiarism, ragging, cyberbullying, sexting, pornography? As far as teachers are concerned, it's a question of whether we exercise as teachers some gender bias or do we ex try to explore some lucrative assignments outside or do we have indulge in biased mentorship and so on. With the university lowering admission standards for most students and alluring with campus placement and then you uh, give false degrees and paid PhDs. These are all the unethical aspects in the education system, which are external situations which will in, ultimately affect the institution as such. As far as colleagues are concerned, decrying colleagues to other students and violating professional confidentiality are some of the factors and so what on with respect to research collaborators and pa parents and community. Next slide, please. Now, basically to identify various types of uh, unethical means, I will not go into much details, but perhaps you can see that there are eight types of things which has to be identified and rectified, like corruption, bribery, immoralities, scandals, etc. Next slide, please. Now, what is an ethical mind and how do we help people develop an ethical mind? There are four stages. One is the disciplined mind in the sense it has to be schooled into becoming experts into something. The other is the synthesizing mind, which by which you are able to correlate with items which are seemingly different and bring them and uh, bring them into a core fashion. a creative mind where you take into in, in, innovate you risk take risks you resolve issues and a reflect, reflective mind which understands and forms relationships so these are the four steps by which one can be helped towards developing uh, developing an ethical mind next your time is up okay so Basically, finally, this is the last slide. Uh, unexpected qualities of ethical leaders. Basically, ethical leaders will selectively show their weaknesses, which apparently looks to be contradictory, but it is true. He has to be a sensor and collect soft data. Manage people with tough empathy. Tough empathy seems to be a very uh, controversial terminology, but it is true and there to be different. Can we go to the last slide, please? The last one. Yeah, this is for you to read. Student and a teacher connect during one small segment of the student's life. Yet through this tiny window of time can blow a gust of strong enough to change the direction of that life. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gadiali, for that wonderful presentation. Allow me at this juncture to bring on board Daniel, our listener. Daniel is going to give us three or four reflections based on the discussion so far. Daniel, welcome. Unmute your microphone, please. Yes. Um, hi, everybody. I'm Daniel Lopez Alort from BA. Um, I'm happy to be here. Uh, well, um, one of the main ideas that this pre-conferences meeting uh, gives us is um, that education is for life and not for living. Yeah, but what kind of life? Undoubtedly, a life uh, with global citizen responsibility, uh, a life with um, and, um, a great relationship between nature and human beings, uh, a life with human rights. Okay, but what kind of education? An ethical education, yes, but what kind of ethics? Um, 
according to the um, the uh, thoughts about that, uh, ethics is uh, like the uh, all Greek and Roman th thinkers uh, said, and later Christian think thinkers too. And now uh, philosophers of Martin Osbaum or, uh, or Julia uh, or Julia Anna says, it's, a, it's an ethic based on values and, and virtues, not um, technical values, instead of um, a great uh, love to uh, human humans. Um, solidarity was the uh, word that um, Iran used. Solidarity of the others is another kind of love. Okay. Another reflection is about... Uh, One minute. Yes, education online is not uh, only for the pandemic period. Uh, sure, it will be after the pandemic. Uh, in this case, we must prepare to teach uh, on, uh, online. And I use the flipped classroom as the method because uh, to me is the, the better method. So um, I'm sure at the end of this conference meeting, um, it will be better because the knowledge is uh, development every day and every day. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Daniel, for that, those few reflections. Allow me at this juncture to bring on board Melita. Melita is going to do her presentation on youth financial responsibility, how to develop it. Melita, you have seven minutes. Welcome. Thank you, Herbert. Dear all, it's a great uh, privilege to welcome you all from Croatia. So I'm thankful to Globe Ethics for connect us all together and uh, for this opportunity to share this case study with you. Now we will uh, be focused on two questions. First one is how a stock exchange can uh, encourage youth financial responsibility. And the other is how to connect their financial responsibility with ethics and global citizenship. Now I will try to start with our slide. Okay, uh, in Croatia we have uh, two elements. One is a national survey regarding uh, financial literacy. That survey showed that uh, youth are especially vulnerable. Their uh, level of knowledge and behavior toward money was very low. And uh, the other element is our uh, working group. In this working group, we have different uh, companies, different faculties and other institutions, which deals with uh, financial literacy from elementary school to retired people. So we as a stock exchange are focused on uh, youth. How are we um, dealing with them? So we have special events uh, for young people, for example, lectures, or they can um, participate in a financial quiz. And uh, we have students for high schools and from universities. Uh, of course, they are coming from Croatia, but they are also from Europe. For example, we have study groups from Netherlands or Switzerland. And we also had a lot of exchange students from Brazil, South Africa, or uh, United States. And um, it's interesting, they are all uh, very active when uh, stock exchange topics are included, but we also uh, find a way how to include topic uh, regarding my money, <clears throat> how I care about my money. 
there are certain ways how we um, have interactive games and how we encode students. For example, uh, we have games which shows why it is important to be um, so individually responsible. Uh, for example, I have to prepare my own uh, investment plan, I have to record my costs, or I have to be aware of uh, risks and uh, some other games. And uh, these games are our way how to make them more aware of their responsibility. We have also games uh, related to uh, trading, stock exchange trading. This is our way how to prepare students for actual real uh, trading. We don't want them to lose real money and then can, uh, they can uh, play on online games. And uh, now we can see uh, the second question, how this youth financial responsibility is connected to ethics and global responsible citizenships. There are a few principles which we emphasize when we are in uh, connection with students. For example, as I said, the first uh, and really, really important one is individual responsibility. So today as a student, I'm responsible for managing my money, but tomorrow I will be responsible for corporate money or for other people money. And uh, I have to know uh, toward whom I'm responsible to. So maybe as a broker, I'm responsible to uh, my clients, to my company, to the law and uh, to the media. So they have to be aware of their responsibility. They also have to be aware of uh, their uh, proactive approach. So I can't just follow advertisement. I just, I just uh, have to see what is appropriate for me. Uh, this is also connected to the next important uh, term, and this one is risk. So we have two types of uh, risks which are important for uh, students. The one is I have to be aware of risks of financial instruments in which I invest in. And the other is I have to be aware of my own attitudes toward risks. And of course, uh, the other term is consequences. Unfortunately, we have a lot of examples uh, of companies, of directors, of institutional investors, how they uh, misconduct and then they maybe have some penalties or maybe some of them uh, are in jail. So that's why we want to <clears throat> for students to be in that uh, position and to think, am I ready <clears throat> to live with all of these consequences? <clears throat> um, when we talk about consequences, <clears throat> we also have to be aware that uh, we have on one side best practices, for example, uh, codes, uh, how to invest and on the other side we have bad practice like insider information not to use it or market manipulation that's why we also uh, give them a lot of real examples from all over the world uh, how to one minute be aware of consequences and they have to be aware they can uh, invest in uh, ethical companies and by that be globally responsible. And at the end, uh, we want to emphasize that uh, types of capital, money, time, and virtues. The most one is virtues because uh, it's not enough to have money. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we need different uh, levels of financial literacy and uh, different participants to develop it. And by respecting and pr practicing all these principles, responsibility, risks, consequences, we can be uh, financial responsible global citizens. Thank you. Thank you so much, Melita, for that wonderful presentation. Uh...
Uh, I take this opportunity again to welcome Christine to lead us uh, in the second next session on question and answer. Thank you, Herbert. Um, just following your presentation, Melita, you, you, you ended with this um, concept of being globally responsible. The majority of your, your presentation focused on kind of individual motivation for personal responsibility and avoiding corruption and the negative consequences that can come from that, which is you know, very, a very direct um, need to, when working with youth. My question is, do you find the youth also motivated by this um, question of how we use our money or don't use our money you know, to achieve global sustainability and to be globally responsible? And is that part of your curriculum? Thank you for that question. It's interesting that, uh, I mean, 10 years ago, maybe we didn't see so many of these awareness, but uh, recent studies show that millennials are so aware of their uh, global citizenship and they want to, for example, work in ethical uh, companies and they want to be uh, included in ethical investments. So they are more and more uh, really included in that. Thank you so much. Maybe we can hear more in a moment. Going back to Zohar, um, we have um, a couple of questions. One has to do with um, in developing countries like mine, says the questioner, where politicians influence every sphere of the economy, how can we achieve the balance between individuals, institutions, and governments? And related to that, how can we motivate and enable business people to be ethical leaders? Put yourself off mute. What I said was it's a, it's a good question and difficult to answer. Anyway, coming to the first part of it is, uh, you know, the individuals and the, the imbibement of ethics by the individuals. It's a question of uh, uh, what you said was that if there is a big difference between the environmental ethics or the absence of ethics in the environment as compared to an individual who is highly ethical and would like to do ethical things, how do we really change, you know? Is it really possible for us to, but the important thing is that even in a society where you have a large amount of unethical, there are definitely some few ethical people and it is possible to start off and motivate and gather momentum instead of saying that it can never happen. So from, the, from that point of view, somewhere somebody has to start, otherwise, this virus of corruption, bribery, fraud will continue. And we cannot always allow that to continue. There has to be some place where some people will have to say, no, it cannot be done. And we have to go ahead with that. Thank you. These are, these are big questions. We're just touching on them. And it's good we do. It's good we put a point on some of these big questions that we want to go into more later. Also for Zohair, there is a big interest in um, some of the, the, the content of, of your, of your um, kind of training. I know we don't have time to go much into it now, but maybe a, a, a moment on this four steps to developing an ethical mind, interest in that, in this information age. And the question is, why is it a work only of the mind? Why do you frame it in terms of the mind? Okay, now basically when we are talking about the four steps which have to be taken and mind you, these four steps are not consequential or not sequential rather. Uh, one can precede the other. They have been mentioned as, uh, you know, appearing to be sequential. Uh, I'll very quickly go through the question of the discipline mind in the sense that if one has to develop uh, uh, an outward uh, ambition of being ethical. Uh, there has to be something within you which you can do better than others. So that is the feeling that one should get that there are certain aspects which I can do better than others. Number two, a synthesizing mind. 
where you are able to correlate and converge seemingly diverse situations and bring about some sort of a semblance of solution. So you need to practice uh, from the point of view of bringing all these things together. Uh, the third thing is creative mind in the sense that uh, you should be able to look at the third and the fourth dimension. Uh, you have to train your mind to look at dimensions which are beyond common perception. And uh, you have to be able to innovate and an appetite of risk should be high because you should be able to subject yourself to the risk situations. And the third, the last one is respectful mind in the sense that you, are, you have a lot of empathy. You understand various forms of relationships. And that is how over a period of time, uh, if, you, if one practices this, it could lead to an ethical mind. Thank you very much. We want to know more and we know we will look into your materials. Um, just, um, I will pass it back to Herbert now, uh, maybe just to mention for Melita um, to be thinking about for later in the conversation, there seems to be a, a real interest in hearing more about um, ethical investing and um, what you ended on, which is the global political context. Um, and so an interest in the personal ethics, but an interest in how, how we invest our money um, you know, influences our global sustainability. So maybe you could think about a, a comment around that for later. Back to Herbert, thank you. Thank you, Christine. Uh, at this point, I, I wish to bring on board uh, the fourth finalist, uh, Josephine Raj, who will be presenting to us on the rationale of ethics for global citizens. Welcome, Raj. You have seven Thank minutes. You. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Herbert, uh, for the kind introduction. And greetings from India. I'll be presenting on rationale of ethics for global citizens. So may I see this? Yeah. And I appreciate uh, global ethics for this uh, making uh, this track very interesting. and. Uh, I appreciate all the previous uh, panelists for sharing their ideas, which may be a concluding remarks for all that three will be my paper. One of the main purpose of promoting ethics in higher education is the development of responsible global citizens as already we said. I understand it is the vision and the end result of what we are here to build new bridges together. However, in my presentation entitled Rationale of Ethics for Global Citizen would bring forth dilemmas involved in the categorization of global citizenship and tries to push our whole discussion with the importance of ethics in the dilemmas. A slide. Global citizens means a person beyond national boundaries considering the world as a nation. I know I am making a fundamental, maybe a basic talk on the whole discussion so far. Actually, it's a virtual reality, not an official one, but it's a virtual reality. Uh, even without a, a passport, by a technology, we can, I can be anywhere uh, in the world. It's a virtual reality. And higher education played an important role in creating this consciousness of global citizenship. And like this academic exchange of academic uh, you know, knowledge and uh, migration, all that helped for this uh, consciousness of global citizen. Further, the current pandemic also has sharpened the awareness of the need for an ethos of global citizenship. Global citizenship, citizen will have a huge responsibility to work with others to make our world more equal, fair, and sustainable. Let me put forward some of the dilemmas that I found as I was doing a work or study on this. 
one of first dilemma that is about the categorization of the global citizen you know when we say global citizen it presupposes that all human beings are part of it those who agree or not you know in general sense all are part of it who can connect uh, you know globally or not all included it also presupposes an undercurrent dichotomy between privileged citizens and unprivileged citizens in the global scenario you know um, you know privileged and unprivileged what i meant is uh, in terms of economic political geographical religious uh, you know diversified you know people are there you know those are able to connect with the people and not able to connect with them. there is a you know categorization of people within the global scenario is available maybe uh, uh, have and have not a uh, division maybe a uh, oppressor and oppressed a uh, division can be seen a, a dilemma how we categorize second one is about regulation who regulate this global citizen who regulate whom it's a pertinent pertaining question actually is it uh, you know uh, south asia uh, regulates all other or europe or uh, american continent or africa regulates uh is it or who define and create and implement the rights for global citizen yes who and other important international institutions pulling representative from around the globe is a suitable solution but as of, as of now uh, such is not a, a kind of you know such is not an important one but as of but as of now the regulation is happening by ourselves who regulate all these things first individual is the important thing because the uh, you know most of the people those who are belong to a country uh, denies to have a global citizenship you know uh, 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 british prime minister theresa may have said in, in in a sense like this if you believe you are a citizen of the world you are a citizen of nowhere that's what the comment is surely you know we must understand it's a self regulated global ethics self regulated global global ethics a global citizens when the global citizens act and what self regulated there emerges various problems various issues mainly i would point out the issue of diversity second the issue of you know uh, you know not considering the local issues the first one is a uh, diversity you know india is a, a just example of that you know arguing for uh, you know having a lot of diversity which may bring lot of issues uh, when i am self regulated uh, you know ethical thinking happening as a global citizen second issue in a slide is related to when being a globalized citizen there is a chance to respond global issues in the virtual arena and forget the local issues nearby the, the uh, concrete need, that, that's a need of the time actually we may forget the issues in our place and we talk about the issues of the world uh, that can be a uh, issue in short these pertinent issues though my list is i know very limited list to think us about ethics that is needed in these dilemmas which would contribute to the consciousness of responsible global citizens yes, as well as the minute yeah minute. yeah yeah I'll, thank you otherwise if we are not coming with an ethics uh, which is uh, applicable for global citizen it will be a total chaos next slide why this ethics is for actually ethics is a guiding principle for global citizen which guides their life and the main purpose is for common good satisfying basic basic global human needs and the shared responsibility actually in this ethics these should be our characteristics or these should be our prime importance where the shared responsibility is very important no one man show or a powerful person comes in the for uh, in forefront and talk and also it is the aim is formation of responsible global citizens and final one that is the focus where sensitivity to others when we say global citizens having a this is the focus is sensitivity to the others next one slide so with that focus sensitivity to others we, i i would uh, want to say 
the global citizenship is a hope for the unprivileged people as i said the dilemmas there is two kinds of necessity two slide two kinds of people one is privileged citizen and the other other side the unprivileged citizens so this global citizen should ship should be a hope for the unprivileged how first one smart forms of globalization second vision for the subaltern people you know think globally and act locally know about the issues of the world and be firm in the local issues we find out and do that in a slide please and i will be concluding yep. and yep. final one vision for the subaltern people the the people who are not able to assess this issue with a, such a question let me conclude my with my words are here you know you know such a subaltern vision must be cherished in our ethical thinking therefore we can make a responsible global citizen in the coming age thank you for this time thank you jaspin for that wonderful presentation just a, a final round of questions i pass on the mic to christine again to thank you very much jaspin. thank you very much herbert thank you jaspin um you um very interestingly went to some of the basics in the whole conversation. You went to the basics of the concept of global citizenship and shared around the difficulty in this category, but in the end held out some hope for it. And, um, and we have, and, and in the end, in this, this proposal about sensitivity to others, I hear a resonance with Irina, where we started. Yeah, um, yeah. Solidarity. We have one question for you, um, which is, do we, do we need to regulate um, global, global citizenship? And if so, how? Well, and yeah, I actually see another here, which I'll put forward. Um, how can we, so you, you also state that higher education is a key place to create a consciousness of global citizenship and of the ethics that we want to promote within global citizenship. And so is it too late to start in higher education? Yeah, uh, that's uh, what the presentation is all about. How to regulate, as of now, uh, we don't have a, a kind of official, you know, uh, the thing that to say global citizen is an utopian idea some people used to say. At the same time, it is therefore I argue that it's a self motivated global citizenship that is, uh, we find it. It is uh, where the regulation should happen within ourselves. I think I may be resonating with the other panelists in which ourselves will be uh, the person regulate in which we these are the consideration that i have shared uh, should be kept in our mind as we interact globally uh, so that's a self-motivated uh, regulation should be there and the second one yes higher education as global ethics is standing for that i know i gone through the history and all standing for that and it is the a good signal uh, we must cherish such a, uh, an ethical principles uh, in which we consider uh, everyone equal and give importance to priorities to the people of uh, you know you know uh, uh, you know underprivileged uh, people more uh, uh, opportunities and bring them up uh, and uh, make higher education accessible for everyone and make a better world. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Maybe I'll just um, read read a, a question as a kind of final comment and then pass it back to Herbert. Um, the, 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 the question comment is, um, don't we need to bear in mind for uh, concurrent streams in our world, one that emphasizes the togetherness, unity, and interrelatedness, and the other that emphasizes the particularity as for example articulated in local situations and experiences so a statement that we need to hold in tension the global and local and yeah. never lose the the particularity and the richness that comes through that but find some common values that we can work on together i pass it back to you herbert thank you christine for moderating that session uh, 
we have come to an end. We are already one hour on the mark. Thank you, the panelists, for taking us through this wonderful one hour. You have given us uh, ideas to ponder about in relation to leading us towards uh, a global citizenship, which is a wonderful idea, especially at this time. I wish at this point, before I go back to Christine to make a few announcements, I wish at this time to acknowledge uh, all of you who have taken part in this session, all the participants, thank you very much once again for coming on board. Thank I you. wish to thank all those many faces that are the background who have been helping us to ensure that this works and the success of this has been managed by so many people. I wish to first of all start by acknowledging Monsignor Professor Obiora Ike, the Executive Director Globethics.net and the entire team of Globethics.net in Geneva. And working in the background is Lucy Lopez, the Deputy Executive Director, Emele Ekwe, who ably was taking the role of overall coordination in this exercise. And many others, Victoria, Manasa, Antho, Alexandra, for the technical support. Anya, for being the rapporteur for this session. And Christine, for co-moderating with me. Thank you very much. All these were the faces behind whom we did not see, but have done a wonderful work to make us uh, succeed as much as we have. So Christine, thank you very much. And back to you. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, Herbert. And just a couple of announcements uh, before you're invited to, to turn your mics on. Um, as you know, uh, this is part of a pre-conference process leading to our conference on Thursday, June 25th, this Thursday. So our conference will be from same time, 3 p.m. CET, Geneva time, for three hours. And you are really welcome to invite your network to join as, as registration is still open for the conference. We have a few more pre-conference events. Um, the next one is on Wednesday, 24 June. And it's a chance to explore in more detail the online library and the work in publications that globeethics.net does. And so this, this will be of interest to many of you because these are rich resources available to you and that we can continue to build together with your inputs. And to remind you that the digital papers and virtual posters that were submitted by some of our uh, participants and some of our speakers are available for viewing on the conference website there is also a discussion forum where we can keep the discussion going. And all, all of that also to say that you see there are more comments and questions and thoughts than we have time to respond to here, but they're all being taken note of. And the, the whole purpose of this event is to gather what's on our mind and see how we can build on it together. So there will be a post-conference process and you're invited to stay tuned and to be a part. So thank you so much to be for all of you um, being with us today. And we look forward to seeing you again online um, in the discussion forum and in the live chats in the webinar. And I invite you now just to take an informal moment and turn your mics on and say hello to each other if you wish. Hello. Thank you very much. Hello. Oh, thank you. Hello, everybody. Hello. Thank you. 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 you. Thank 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 you.